You're listening to the Futures Podcast with me, Luke Robert Mason. On this episode, I speak to academic and law lecturer John Danaher. When I say that humans are obsolescing, that doesn't mean that they're going to become extinct or irrelevant to the future. It just means that their activities will be less significant. John shared his insights into the possibility of a post-work economy, the impact of increasing automation, and how our future might be determined by either becoming a cyborg or retreating into the virtual. This episode was recorded on location in London, England, before John's book launch event at London Futurists. You open the book with this phrase, and this statement really, human obsolescence is imminent. What did you mean by that? Yeah, I've been taking a bit of flack for using that phrase to open the book because it sounds so sort of pessimistic and ominous. I have to confess it was a little bit of, you know, rhetorical hyperbole. So I mean that humans are becoming less useful to making changes in the world or to particular domains of activity. And I tried to trace out this trend towards human obsolescence across different domains over human history. So agriculture is an obvious example where once upon a time, the majority of people in, used to work in agriculture. We now see a significant decline or reduction in the number of people working in agricultural related industries, you know, less than 5% in most European countries from over 50% as little as 100 years ago. I also look at the decline of human activity in manufacturing, in medicine and the professions, at law, in scientific inquiry. I look at some new studies that have been done on robotic scientists who can create their own experiments and test their own hypotheses in politics, in bureaucratic management, and in policing. So I look at the trend towards automation across all these domains of activity, and that I think supports the claim that there is this growing obsolescence of humans. Which is one qualification to that, though, that I would say is that when I say that humans are obsolescing, that doesn't mean that they're going to become extinct or irrelevant to the future. It just means that their activities will be less significant. I mean, you actually go one step further and you say that this could be an opportunity for optimism. So th this is it. Th this is the kind of rhetorical strategy in a sense that you're setting it up this seemingly ominous claim that we're obsolescing. And this is something that a lot of people will be worried about. They'll view it in a pessimistic light. But I try to argue that it is actually an opportunity for optimism, partly because it allows us to transcend our existing way of life in particular, to escape from the drudgery of paid employment and to pursue a post-work utopia. And I, and I think that is really important because you're not talking about the obsolescence of humanity from planet Earth. You're talking about the obsolescence of humanity within the workplace and the workforce. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So can we talk a little bit about this, this idea of a post-work future? And in the book, you set up this notion of the fact that a, a post-work future will be a good thing. Do you think it really will be an utopian outcome to have a post-work future, or do you think it could lead to boredom and, and chaos? If it's the case that humans are no longer going to be useful in the workplace, or are going to become less and less useful over time, such that more and more people will not pursue paid employment in their lives, this leads to two deprivations. One is a deprivation of income, which of course is essential nowadays because people need an income in order to survive, to pay for the goods and services that enable them to flourish, but also could lead to a deprivation of meaning because we live in societies where work is valorized in the sense that it's valued. The work ethic is seen as a positive thing. It's how people make a contribution to their societies. It's how people often define themselves. So if we take that away from people, they're going to have this crisis of meaning. So how can we fill that gap in order to address that crisis of meaning? And, you know, the real goal of the book was to examine that cri potential crisis of meaning and whether there is actually an opportunity for optimism embedded in it. I mean, just some people love their jobs, but in the book you say, uh, you know, you should really hate your job. And what I argue in the book is not so much that everybody will necessarily hate their jobs, because, you know, hatred is a feeling you have towards the work that you do, and it's quite possible that many people will have positive feelings towards the work that they do. So what I argue instead is that work is structurally bad in that we've fallen into a pattern of employment that is bad for many workers, getting worse, partly as a result of technology. And so we should be concerned about the future of work and we should look to possible ways to transform and possibly even you know, transcend 
the need for work. So the sort of work that you're talking about is is really work that's done for money, exchange time for money. That's, that's your definition of work. Yeah, you know, you have to be careful when you talk about the post-work future and the concept of work. The first thing you learn when you talk about the notion of a post-work future is that people have different definitions in mind of what work is. You know, some people have very expansive definitions of work. They think work is any physical or mental activity performed by humans. So if you talk about a post-work future, if that's your definition in mind, then it probably really just makes no sense because humans are always going to perform some kinds of physical or mental activities. So we're always going to work in that broad and expansive sense. So I, I try to adopt a, a narrower interpretation of what work is as paid employment. So that means that work for me is not any particular kind of activity. It is rather a condition under which activities are performed, namely a condition of economic reward of some sort. The economic reward does not necessarily have to be immediately realized. You know, sometimes there are unpaid forms of work that are done in the hope of receiving a future reward. So there are lots of young students who take unpaid internships, for example, in the hope that they will secure paid employment. The reason we're able to talk about a post-work future is this possibility of automation. And I mean, that's at the core of the book, the the fear that we're going to become obsolete because of automation. Automation is going to be the thing that's going to take our jobs. I just wondered why automation of work is both possible and desirable. Lots of things have been written in the past decade or so about technological unemployment and the future of work. Many interesting arguments and claims about the percentage of jobs that are computerizable or automatable. I tried to engage with those kinds of studies and look at whether it's really possible to automate work. I think there's a couple of points to bear in mind when you're trying to evaluate that claim. One is that I think a lot of people approach this with the wrong set of concepts. So they, they think about the displacement of workers or jobs when they really should be thinking about the displacement of work-related tasks. The kinds of automating technologies that we're developing at the moment are, to use a you know, somewhat technical term, they're kind of narrow forms of artificial intelligence. They can be good at performing certain kinds of functions or tasks in the workplace. They're not general forms of intelligence. They can't usually perform all the different tasks in the workplace. So what happens when you automate or introduce automating technologies into the workplace is that you replace humans in the performance of certain tasks. That doesn't necessarily mean that you eliminate jobs or eliminate workers because oftentimes workers can move into complementary tasks. One of the examples I have of this in the book is to do with legal workplaces, let's say. Within a given law firm, there are lots of tasks that a lawyer, a lawyer or a team of lawyers will perform in order to provide a valuable service to their clients. They'll engage in document review, you know, reviewing contracts or other complex legal documents. They will engage in legal research, looking up cases and statutes to see how the law can be used to the benefit of their client. They will entertain and schmooze with their clients to make them feel good about the service that they're offering. They will present and argue in court on behalf of their clients. So there's all these different tasks that are performed within that workplace. And automating technologies at the moment can do some of those tasks. So we've got pretty good technologies now for document review and you know, emerging technologies that enable some kinds of legal, basic legal research and prediction of the outcome of cases for law firms. At the moment, we don't have robots that are very good at schmoozing with clients and entertaining them. So if you introduce automating technologies into a legal workplace, you might find that human workers are displaced from the tasks of document review and certain kinds of legal research. And they move into the more customer relations side of it and maybe also then arguing court cases in, in court in order to persuade a judge or a jury. Automation changes the dynamic of the workplace. That might mean that some workers are eliminated because their jobs are purely defined in terms of the tasks that machines are good at, but other workers aren't necessarily eliminated because they have these other things that they can perform that complement what machines do. And I think that that's the piece that we so easily forget that in actual fact, this this automation of the workplace could lead to a complementary relationship between AI and the human. And in fact, IBM Watson in the US, when they look at the work that they're doing to review medical papers, they talk about it as a collaboration between the doctor and IBM Watson. IBM Watson never diagnoses a patient. It makes suggestions to a doctor, a human doctor, to then go and diagnose a patient based on the information that IBM Watson and has ingested and has tried to understand. And I think if we start seeing the future of work being a collaboration, then maybe there's something more exciting about how we engage with this automation. Rather than see it as a threat, maybe we could see it as a potential collaborator. 
in most of these debates about technological unemployment, we focus on the displacement potential of automation, how it displaces workers. But there is also this related phenomenon of how automation can complement what human workers do, and we can collaborate with machines. And so that's kind of the hope, I think, amongst the mainstream economic view is that really technology won't result in this massive decline in jobs. It'll just involve this sort of structural reorientation of the workplace so that we just collaborate with machines and we do what we're good at and the machines do what they're good at. This is the main objection to the claim that we'll have widespread technological unemployment. When I say that there's a possibility of a post-work future, I don't think that that means that no one will work in the future. I just mean that a growing percentage of the adult human population will not work for a living. Um, so I mean, one of the ways in which I illustrate this is in terms of something called the labor force participation rate in countries. So the labor force participation rate is the number of adults of working age who both want work and are at work. In most Western European countries, that figure is somewhere between 60 and 70 percent. So that, that means it's already the case is about 30 to 40 percent of the adult human population that doesn't work for a living or doesn't even want work for a living. So when I talk about a post-work future, I'm talking about a future in which that number of non-working adults continues to grow. What does it mean to reach a true post-work future? I don't know if there's an exact boundary line, but you know, certainly if it's more than 50% of the adult population that is not working, I think you've radically changed the kind of world that we live in. But in terms of this complementarity effect of automation, I'm a little bit skeptical about the potential for this to be a recipe for lots of jobs in the future. When we think about the, the complementarity effect, the, the assumption here is that Machines will replace humans in some kinds of tasks, but this will open up a space of complementary tasks for human workers. But there's a, a challenge here, which is like, can you actually get the people who are displaced into these complementary tasks? And it may turn out to be difficult to do that. They may need to be educated and retrained. There are certain workers who may be at a stage of their lives where it's just not really feasible or possible to educate and retrain them. It may also be the case that there's just not a huge amount of political will to do this or political support for it or educational support for it. So you know, can we actually adapt to this new reality where we have to train different kinds of skills? That's a, that's a serious challenge. There's also another challenge here, which is that the assumption is that we'll be able to train humans into these new tasks at a rate that is faster than the rate at which technology is improving in those tasks. So, I mean, this is something that I think people get wrong when they think about automation and narrow AI, which is that they assume that AI is only good at particular tasks. But of course, we're developing multiple different streams of AI that is good at different tasks. So it could be the case that we can train machines to perform these complementary tasks faster than we can train humans. To give a practical illustration of this, it takes about 20 to 30 years to train a human into the workplace. And, and, and to that point, you say in the book that it can actually lead to this thing called the cycle of immiseration, this cycle whereby you can never catch up. Yeah, so it's this idea that, that automation can be particularly challenging for young people because they need to train themselves to have the skills that are valued in the economy. And so that means they have to get an education that will give them those skills. But how can they get the education? Because education is increasingly costly and expensive for people. So oftentimes the way in which students can pay for their educations is that they work part-time. But an awful lot of those jobs that they work part-time in are the, the jobs that are most at threat of automation. So how are they going to be able to pay for the education that gets them to escape th from this threat of automation? So this is the cycle, potential cycle of immiseration that they can never get out of the rush that they're in. And there's a lot of skepticism around this idea of technological unemployment. And in the book, you use the Luddite fallacy to explain some of that skepticism. I mean, what is the Luddite fallacy? I mean, so the Luddites were famously these protesters in the early part of the Industrial Revolution. They were followers of, I think it's Ned Ludd. Some people claim as a fictional character. There's an interesting history there to that. They smashed these machines because they saw them as a threat to their employment. But looking back on their activities from the vantage point of 150 years later, it seems that they were wrong to do so in the sense that the kinds of automation that existed in the early phases of the Industrial Revolution didn't lead to widespread technological unemployment. In fact, there's probably more people at work in the world today than there ever have been before. So it seems like a fallacy to assume that automation will displaced jobs. And that, that really then kind of leads into this argument about the complementarity effect. There isn't a fixed number of jobs out there to go around. Uh, we're always creating new jobs 
in light of the new kind of socio-technical reality that we've created. Even if some of those jobs, as David Graeber says, are bullshit jobs. Right, yeah. So even if they're kind of meaningless or pointless administrative jobs, they're, they're still jobs that are paid. As you've just outlined, the automation of work is, to a degree, both possible and desirable. But you're clear to state in the book that the automation of life, however, is not as desirable. Could you explain the difference between the two and why that's so important? If we look into how automating technologies affect life more generally, not just working life, I think there are reasons for pessimism. One of the ways in which I illustrate this in the book is to use the example of the Pixar movie WALL-E. Very roughly, WALL-E depicts this kind of dystopian future for uh, humanity where the Earth has become environmentally despoiled. Humans have had to navigate off-planet to these spaceships that are bringing them to some other place that they can live. And there are lots of robots in this future, lots of automating technologies. And the humans on these interstellar spaceships are really fat, obese, slug-like beings. They, they float around in these electronic chairs. They're fed a diet of fast food and light entertainment. And there are all these robots around them scurrying about doing all the work that needs to be done to fly these ships. You know, This has been referred to by some technology critics as like the, the sofalarity. We all just end up on our sofas being fed entertainment and food and everything we need by automating technologies. So we don't really do anything, we just sit back and enjoy the ride. Even though this is an extreme and satirical depiction of the automated future, it does, I think, contain a kernel of truth and something that we should be concerned about, which is that an awful lot of how we derive meaning and value from our lives depends on our agency. The fact that we, through our activities, make some kind of difference to the world. We do things that are objectively valuable to the societies in which we live in, and maybe in some other grander cosmic sense of objective value, and that we are subjectively engaged and satisfied by the actions that we perform. And the problem with automating technologies is that they kind of cut or sever the link between human action and what happens in the world. Because what you're doing when you rely upon an automating technology is that you're outsourcing either physical or cognitive activity to a machine, so that you're no longer the, the agent that's making the difference to the world. And I think this is a kind of serious threat to human meaning and flourishing and something that we should be concerned about. In the book, you set up these two possible scenarios, these two possible utopias, the cyborg utopia and the virtual utopia. And first, I want to talk about this idea of this cyborg utopia. I mean, how would we build a cyborg utopia? People might be familiar with the story of the origin of the term, you know, it's a neologism, cybernetic organism. This idea then has kind of taken hold in biological sciences and social sciences as a notion of something that humans can aspire to, that they can become more machine-like. What does that mean in practice? I mean, there's kind of two different understandings of what a cyborg is, particularly in philosophy. The one understanding is that a cyborg is a kind of literal fusion between human biology and a machine, that you're like integrating machine-like mechanisms into biological mechanisms so that they form one hybrid system. An example of this would be something like a, a brain-computer interface where you're incorporating electrical circuits or chips into neural circuits in order to perform some function from the combination of the two things. For people who listen to this podcast, you interviewed one of the leading pioneers in cyborg technology early on, it's Kevin Warwick, right? So he, he's done all these interesting pioneering studies on brain-computer interfaces and how you can implant chips in one person's brain and send a signal to a robotic arm. That's a kind of a illustration of this form of literal fusion between human biology and technology. There's another understanding of what a cyborg is, though that's quite popular in certain sectors of the philosophical community, mainly associated with a figure called Andy Clark, who says that we're all natural-born cyborgs, and that we are, by our very natures, a technological species. It's one of the defining traits of humanity is that we've always lived in a technological ecology. We don't live in the natural world, we live in a world that's constructed by our technologies. And we have these relationships of dependency with technology and also interdependency. We use hammers and axes and so forth to do things in the world. And we've been increasing the amount of technologization of our everyday lives over the past several thousand years. So we are, we're more integrated with and more dependent on technology. 
we're becoming more cyborg-like over time. For Clark, the relationship that you have with your smartphone, let's say if you're using Google Maps to walk around a city, you have a very interdependent relationship with the technology, you have a little avatar that you follow on screen, and your movements affects the image that you see on the screen. That kind of dependency relationship is an illustration of this other path to cyborg status. It's, it doesn't mean that you literally fuse your biological circuits with the machine circuits, but you have this kind of symbiotic relationship with the technology that means you are a cyborg. You know, the differences between these two kinds of cyborg are differences of degree as opposed to differences of fundamental type, I think. The more interdependency you have with an artifact, the more cyborg-like you become. And it's surprising to me that you start with a cyborg artist, Neil Harbisson, who's a colorblind artist who has, for want of a better description, who has an antenna surgically implanted into the back of his skull that allows him to hear color, although it's not quite hearing, it's slightly more nuanced than that. It's a, a form of electrical bone conduction, which is vibrating his skull, which gives him a, a sense of sound. And what's interesting about Neil Harbisson is that he's a colorblind artist who's now able to hear this color. And he now dreams with these sonochromatic dreams. He no longer sees this antenna as a device, but he sees it as an organ, as part of his body. And in my own interactions with Neil, if, if you go up to him and you watch people try and touch the antenna, it's as if I came up to you, John, and tried to touch your nose. He has the same sort of revulsion to it. It's, it feels to him very much like this, this organ. He's become, as Andy Clark would say, profoundly embodied. And I just wonder why you started with that example of, a, of an artist exploring the cyborgization of his body, because what he's doing seems the furthest thing away from me is something which is practical for use in the workforce. I think he's a a good example, partly because he's somebody who self-identifies as a cyborg. I use a quote from a, an interview with him where he says that, I don't use technology, I am technology. That's the, the phrase that he uses. And, and I think, you know, he's historically set up something like the Cyborg Society, the campaigns for the rights of cyborgs, and more recently something like the Trans Species Society, where he's arguing for a post-human identity as a, as a Concepts. What I find interesting about what Neil is doing is that he is using technology in a way to kind of transcend the limitations of human biological form. To me, what he's doing is he's creating a new kind of sensory engagement with the world, which I find interesting. So he's experimenting with the limits of human form. And to me, this is a utopian project because one of the things I argue in the book is that we shouldn't have a conception of what a utopia is that is, it's like a blueprint for the ideal society. Something like Plato's Republic or Thomas More's utopia, where it's, it's a very rigid formula for what the ideal society should look like. I think we should have a more horizontal understanding of what a utopia is. That A utopian society is one that's kind of dynamic in the right ways. So it's not something that's driven by interpersonal conflict and violence. That's the wrong kind of dynamism that you want in a society. So it's stable in that respect. It's peaceful. But there's an open future for people that we're expanding into new horizons. And so what I think Neil is doing is he's expanding into a new horizon of possible human existence. And that's what I find stimulating and exciting about what he's doing. It seems to me they're trying to explore a, a spectrum of human possibilities. And the, the cyborg is no longer as Kevin uh, Warwick or uh, even Tim Cannon from Grindhouse Wetware would say, it's no longer about upgrading or making the human better or stronger or faster or smarter. For Neil or Moon, it's really about exploring a multitude of differentiated sensory modalities, allowing themselves to uh, be more similar to animals than to machines. It's not necessarily that they're trying to compete with machines in terms of like cognitive ability. What they are doing is that they are exploring different kinds of morphology, different kinds of phenomenology, you know, different ways of experiencing and engaging with the world. And you know, there's two different visions of what transhumanism let's, is, let's say. There's the kind of humanity on steroids view, which is that we're upgrading our existing abilities. We just want more intelligence, more strength, you know, more happiness, that kind of thing. Maybe the, the David Pierce understanding of transhumanism, that it's the three supers, super intelligence, super happiness, and super longevity, super long lives. What Neil and Moon are doing is, is something different, which is 
trying to explore the adjacent possible, I guess, the, the other forms of human existence that might be possible out there. So the question then becomes, are we creating that form of cyborg utopia to have something to do in a post-work society? Because it's not really going to help us compete with the machines versus what Tim Cannon's arguing for, which is this enhanced humanity to a level at which it can be competitive to machine-like processes. If we're, if we're going to be competing in the workplace against uh, automation robots, bots and AI, then if we're able to upgrade our brain and retain all of the fuzziness that makes humanness, humans special, but also do all the things that machines can do, then that makes us a much more useful uh, worker. If there are these different ways of pursuing the cyborg project, either the one of like transcending what is possible for humans and exploring new forms of sensory and embodied engagement with the world, I outline that as one of the main arguments in favor of the cyborg utopia. But the counterpoint to that and one of the detractions from it, I think, is pursuing the other version of it, which is like upgraded humans, because I think what's going to happen if we do that is it's just going to double down on the worst features of the economy that we have at the moment. So you know, instead of just competing on education for employability, you're also going to be competing on having the right kinds of cyborg implants. You know, some people might think this, this holds out a degree of hope for the future of work, because what it might do is it might increase the power of labor relative to capital, because cyborg workers have more bargaining power than ordinary human workers. But I, you know, I'm skeptical of that because it it depends on how cyborg implants get distributed amongst the workforce. You know, is this something that's only going to be available to an elite few? And also, you know, if you think about the kinds of things that a cyborg worker could do better than a machine. Based on what we see at the moment, it's probably going to be something like a warehouse worker or physical worker with an exoskeleton that just enables them to perform dexterous physical tasks uh, with greater speed, efficiency, and that kind of thing. At the moment, it's the case that those kinds of work are often the least valued and least pleasant forms of work in human society. So if that's the way that the cyborg implants are going to go, it doesn't seem to me a recipe for flourishing or utopia. It does seem that the thing that's on the near horizon is the sort of cyborg upgrades that are similar to non-neural prosthetics, the exoskeletons that allow humans to lift heavier objects. But it also feels like there is going to be a race around the human brain, around brain-computer interfaces. And it feels like Brian Johnson and his Colonel Co. in competition with Elon Musk's Neuralink might be the battle we see over the future of work. I just wonder your opinion on those sorts of cybernetic enhancements, the ones that look like they're going to be on the market potentially very soon, if the ways in which they're advocating for these sorts of technologies hold true. If these implants are created partly with the aim of upgrading humans in such a way that they're competitive with machines, I think we're going to kind of double down on what, the worst features of the employment market. So this isn't a recipe for a post-work utopia in my sense. The other thing then I suppose is just you know, a degree of skepticism about the claims that are made on, on behalf of these kinds of technologies, particularly in the short term. There's a lot of criticisms of the kinds of things that Elon Musk are coming up with as to whether they really will be this kind of transcendent implant. What I see at the moment is interesting experiments and proofs of concept, but I don't really see anything that is genuinely transformative. I'm definitely open to being surprised in this field. You know, you know, part of my skepticism here stems from older research interests that I had in the human enhancement debate around pharmacological enhancements. And the philosopher spent a lot of time debating those things and lots of interesting work was done in it. But let's be honest, the, the reality is that we haven't really had any genuine pharmacological enhancements, fairly minor improvements, we might be going down the same route when it comes to these kinds of cyborg enhancements. And that's another reason as well why I think like the alternative pathway to the cyborg future, which is not one of upgrading humanity, but one of moving into this adjacent possible is a more interesting pathway. There is something interesting that the potential of the cyborg utopia leads to, whether it's um, longevity, collective afterlife, or even cyborgs in space, which oddly enough features as both an advantage of a cyborg utopia and a disadvantage of a cyborg utopia. And it was one of the most interesting possibilities in, in that chapter. And I just wonder if you could explain a little bit more about the possibility of cyborgs in space. <laughs> yeah, it does have that kind of cheesy... 1980s science fiction title or something like that, or probably even more dated. Yeah, so like within that chapter on the cyborg utopia, one of the arguments in favor of cyborgism is space exploration and travel. And like this is kind of the original rationale for the cyborg. The original coining of the term was that it would help us to explore 
space. But you know, why why would exploring space be a utopian project? Well, part of it goes back to this notion of expanding the horizons of human possibility. So people like Neil Harbison and Moon Remus, they're expanding the horizons of possible human embodied existence. That's a one horizon that we can explore. But there's also, you know, genuine geographical horizons that we can explore. The sad reality is that we've explored most of the horizons here on Earth, and the horizons that are left to us are in space. And so space provides this kind of almost infinite landscape that we can expand out into and explore new possible forms of human existence in that infinite landscape. And that's interesting, I think, to me. It's part of this kind of need for dynamism and openness in the future. There's also an argument that I'm quite influenced by a guy called Ian Crawford, who's one of the leading proponents of human space exploration, where he outlines this intellectual argument for space travel. So it's to the extent that we think, you know, in new knowledge and new intellectual challenges are a part of what gives meaning to our lives, it seems like exploring space is going to be a recipe for that kind of intellectual excitement and engagement, both in terms of scientific exploration of space, scientific experimentation, scientific examination of interstellar environments and other planets, but also in new forms of aesthetic expression. One of the points that Crawford makes is that, to some extent anyway, our aesthetic expression depends on the kinds of experiences that we have. And as we expand out to, to explore new environments, we're going to have new kinds of aesthetic experiences and new forms of aesthetic expression. So it's a, it's a recipe for kind of enhanced cosmic artwork, for example. And also that we'll have to explore new forms of political and social arrangement. How will we deal with multi-generational starships? You know, how will we manage colonies on multiple planets? What kind of political organization, what kind of ethical rules do we need for that? So there's something interesting here. There are jobs for political and ethical philosophers in this uh, world. It's an intellectually stimulating project. There's also like a, a, another point here, which is that it may in some sense be existentially necessary for us to explore space. It certainly seems to be true in the long run that we'll need to get off planet if we want to survive. But maybe even in the short run, it's something that we need to do to actually continue human existence. And continued human existence is a necessary condition for continued human flourishing. The counterpoint to that is that there could be a lot of risks embedded in it. The philosopher Phil Torres, he's written this interesting paper about the existential risks of space colonization. And one of the points he makes is that as we expand out onto different planets, it's possible that humans will speciate because they'll be facing different kinds of selective pressures on different in different environments. So they'll form kind of different groups with different needs, different ideologies. This is going to be a recipe for potential conflict between the different groups on different planets. And you know, how do we manage conflict here on Earth? Well, going back to the work of British political philosopher Thomas Hobbes, we need some kind of leviathan, some kind of political institutional structure that keeps the peace between people. And Torres's point is it's going to be very, very difficult to have a cosmic solar system-wide or intergalactic leviathan, right? So what's going to happen then is that there's a danger that these different colonies with different interests and needs perceive each other as a threat to their continued survival and flourishing. So they engage in these preemptive strikes to wipe out the threat. There's no cosmic leviathan to keep the peace. And so we're going to have this like massive intergalactic war, and this leads Torres to conclude that we should delay space colonization and exploration as much as possible. Some of what Torres says, I think, is fanciful and speculative. And I, I think there are reasons to believe that actually surviving on different planets might reduce the kinds of conflict between different groups. You know, I, I use this kind of glib phrase in the book from Robert Frost, that, you know, good fences make for good neighbors. And what could be a better fence than a couple of light years of cold, dark space, Right. But there's also maybe problems on individual colonies within space that because they face such extreme conditions of existence that aren't necessarily hospitable to creatures like us, they could create the conditions for very authoritarian forms of government. So the astrobiologist Charles Cockle has written some very interesting papers on this phenomenon about tyranny in space colonies being a serious problem. So those are some reasons to be cautious about the project of space colonization as being something that's truly utopian.
I wonder almost if uh, the work that Neil Hardbisson is doing with trans species, the new political ways in which we'll have to organise society here on Earth as we create a differentiated form of humanity based on all of our different cybernetic additions and enhancements that will prepare us for dealing with the politics of subspeciation. Yeah, no, I, so I think that's a, a weakness in the Torres argument. So the assumption that he's making is that staying on planet is better than going off planet, but actually staying on, there are lots of existential risks that we face when we're on planet and we could face the very similar kinds of political strife and engage. So we're going to have to confront those kinds of problems anyway, probably, even if we stay put on Earth. What you were just saying is the reason that cyborgism isn't really the utopia we're looking for because it feels like these developments are so far away. But the utopia that could just be around the corner is the virtual utopia. Just help me to understand what you mean by virtual when you talk about this virtual utopia. This is the trickiest part of the book by far. And it's also the bit that I think has confused most people. One thing I'll just say at the outset is that I think the concept of a virtual form of existence is inherently problematic and nebulous. So like, I don't think there's ever, there's such a thing as a, a completely virtual way of life, but there is a way of life, I think, that has elements to it that qualify as virtual. Now, how I understand the concept of a virtual way of life, I'm better at defining what it's not than necessarily defining what it is. So the forms of a virtual utopia that I, that I don't agree with are what I call the stereotypical view of what a virtual utopia is, which is the computerized the computer simulation view. So what, what a virtual form of existence is, is that, you know, you immerse yourself in a computer simulated environment, something like, let's say, the holodeck from Star Trek or you know, Neil Stevenson's metaverse from his popular novel in the early 90s, The Snow Crash, which was actually quite influential for people creating virtual reality technologies. That form of existence, that's certainly virtual in some senses, because some of the things that happen within a computer simulated environment or some of the objects and people you encounter aren't quite real. And one of the illustrations I have of this in the book is, imagine you've, you're in a computer simulated environment, which is there's an apple on a table, let's say. Clearly, the apple isn't a real apple. It's a visual representation of an apple. It doesn't have the physical properties that a real apple has to have. It doesn't have the right mix of you know, proteins and sugars and all that. It exists as a simulation of a real world apple. And, and that, what, that's what makes it virtual in that world. But it's also true to say that things that ha- lots of things that happen in a computer simulation will be real, you can have real conversations with other people through avatars in a virtual environment. We do this all the time already. We, we live an increasing amount of our lives in digital spaces. But I don't think anyone would say that the kinds of interactions that we have in those spaces are not real. In fact, they're very real and very consequential. You know, the, the emotional experiences that you can have in a, in a computer simulated world are, can be real. You can be really afraid, you can be really happy, you can be really traumatized by things that happen to you. People can, quote unquote, assault you, you know, in, a, in a virtual environment, not in the sense that they physically harm you, but they can psychologically harm you. And in law, we recognize psychological harm as a form of assault. I think the stereotypical view of virtual reality is flawed because it doesn't make these distinctions between things that are real within a virtual environment or a computer simulated environment and things that are not real within computer simulated environment. You make it very clear that you're not talking about virtual reality as we know it currently, the the headsets and the Oculus Rift. You're, you're talking about this notion of the virtual, which is whereby we're comfortable with certain things which are not physically real and yet still actual. So, for example, fictional characters, you use the example of Sherlock Holmes in the book. Right. Yeah. I mean, so the, the, the Sherlock Holmes example is that how does he exist? Well, he clearly doesn't exist as a real physical person, but he does exist as a real fictional character. And you can make claims about Sherlock Holmes that are true and false. Sherlock Holmes lived at 22A Baker Street. Now, that's a, a real claim about the fictional character Sherlock Holmes. You, know, there, you can describe actions that he took place in, in, in the novels. So, so he has a real form of, of existence. It just doesn't re- exist as a real physical person. Different kinds of things in the world have different existence conditions attached to them. Things like apples and chairs, you know, they have to have a real physical existence in order to count as an instance of an apple or a chair. But there are other things that don't actually have to have a physical existence to count as a real thing. All right, so, so actually, one of the points I make about Sherlock Holmes is that you could have a detective that exists in a purely computer-simulated form. Right? Because what, what a detective is, it's really just a functional 
thing. It, it solves crimes. And there are already people trying to create AI that can help in solving crimes. Are those AIs not real? Are they virtual simply because they exist inside a computer? No, because they, they are functional objects. What they need to, be, to really exist is to perform the right function. Again, this gets back to the point that things that exist in computer simulated environments, some of them are not real, some of them are purely virtual, but some of them are actually r- real because they perform the functions that those things are supposed to perform. They're real insofar as they can have an effect on us and our emotions and our experience. Yeah, so that's that's another kind of reality. But yeah, so it, they do they make a difference to the world in some way. You, you use uh, the, the author of Sapiens, Nora of Al Harari's idea of uh, how certain things in what we perceive as in real life, everyday reality, as having some element of simulation to them. These these fictions, these meta fictions that we create to us become real, whether it's religion or capitalism. These aren't natural things. They're artificial things that we've given a degree of agency. Therefore, those fictions, again, become a real part of everyday lived reality. The Harari view is kind of the counterpoint to the, the stereotypical view of virtual reality that we have is it's, it's this computer simulated thing. The Harari view, some, I refer to it in the book as the counterintuitive view, which is that actually pretty much all large chunks of our lives already are virtual. That's his main claim, right? And you know there are two ways of making that claim. Harari makes it one way, but I'm going to make a, a adjacent claim that I think supports the same point, which is that actually a huge amount of our lives are lived in artificially constructed environments as is. Right now, as we're speaking, we're having this conversation in a room that shields us from the external environment, has artificial lighting, artificial heating, and so forth. So you know, humans have long been creating these artificial environments in which we can live out our lives, in which we are shielded from a lot of the consequences, a lot of the negative features of the real world. And so you could argue that the long-term trend for civilization is to have an increasingly virtual form of life living inside increasingly artificial environments. So this is kind of a parallel to Andy Clark's point about us being natural-born cyborgs. What I'm suggesting here is we're kind of natural-born virtual beings as well. Harari's point is slightly different, which is that actually, in addition to the artificiality of the environments that we live in, a lot of the meaning and value that we attach to the activities we perform in these environments is a projection of our imagination. So his example of religion, he uses this illustration of if you look around Jerusalem, you know, lots of people attach religious significance and meaning to artifacts in that physical environment, but it, it's not actually intrinsic or inherent in the objects. If you investigated them scientifically, you wouldn't find their holiness, so to speak. It's something that we project onto the environment through our minds. And this is a more general point that has been made by by others in more or less radical forums, you know. I use a quote from Terence McKenna in the book, which is I mean, the most extreme illustration of this, which is like reality is a collective hallucination. But, you know, philosophers as respectable of, as Immanuel Kant have essentially argued that a large part of how, what we experience in the world is something that we project onto that world. So we're running a kind of virtual reality simulator in our minds that we use to interpret our experiences. Harari goes a step further when people are worried about what the future holds, is it, does it mean we're all just going to live inside virtual reality machines and play computer games all the time? He makes the claim that actually we're already doing that. And he goes so far as to suggest that religion is itself a virtual reality game. He also uses consumerist capitalism as an illustration of this, right? So religion is a virtual reality game where you score points by performing the right behaviors and you level up at the end by going to paradise. So this is literally the claim he makes, right? I think as provocative as Harari is, and I think he's right to say that a large part of what we currently do and the way we currently live is virtually simulated in our minds, I think he goes a step too far. Because I think if you asked religious believers whether what they're doing is a virtual reality game, they would say, absolutely not. This is, I really believe that these things are holy and what I'm doing really matters. I don't think that what I'm doing is inconsequential or trivial. It's not a game to me. So what I argue for instead is that we kind of embrace this Harari-like counterintuitive view of what virtual reality is, but we step back a little bit from his extreme interpretation, which is that everything is kind of a virtual reality game, and we argue that there's only certain kinds of things that are virtual reality games, and they are things that we know ourselves to be games. So we know that there is a kind of arbitrary set of rules that we've applied to the way in which we engage and perform activities. So all games to me are a form of virtual reality. 
to take the example of chess. You know, there's nothing in the laws of physics that dictate that you have to move pieces around a chessboard in a particular way. You don't. We have constructed a set of rules that we apply to how we engage with the chessboard and that they constrain how we behave in that environment, but we know that they are arbitrary rules. Nevertheless, people play these games and there are good ways of playing them. There are ways of playing it skillfully and well, and people derive great meaning and satisfaction from performing the, playing these games. Some people dedicate their entire lives to doing so, right? but they know that they are games. And what I'm suggesting, so just to finish the point with the virtual utopia chapter, is that we can use that as a model for a virtual utopia, where everything we do is, in a sense, a game. When you set up the propositions at the beginning of the book, you're talking about this virtual utopia. I, I, I wondered, is John suggesting that we will escape into virtual reality? But no, what you're suggesting is something much more nuanced. You set up the qualities that a virtual utopia should have, which are very similar to rules of a game. And I just wonder if you could share some of those qualities and, and why you think those are so important for creating this virtual utopia. My understanding of virtual utopia is technologically agnostic in that I think you can realize a virtual form of existence in many different kinds of environments. You can do it in a computer simulated environment, and I don't deny that, and I'm open to that possibility, and I use examples of that in the book. But you can also realize it in the real world. Games are a way of doing this. So, you know, I rely in the book on a theory from a philosopher called Bernard Suits about what a game is. So Suits wrote this very odd book back in the 70s. It's a dialogue about what a game is and what a utopia is. What he argues is that a game is something that has three properties. It has a pre-illusory goal, it has a illusory attitude, and a set of constitutive rules. Pre-illusory goal is something that you do that can be identified before you, you know what the game is that constitutes success in the game. In a sense, he argues that it's a kind of scoring points in a game. So to use, use the illustration I have in the book, the game of golf, the pre-illusory goal in golf is to get your ball into a hole. And that's, that's the end state that you want to reach. The constitutive rules are the way in which you have to go about achieving the pre goal. And the constitutive rules, what they do is they set up arbitrary obstacles to achieving the goal in the most efficient possible way. Right? So the most efficient way to get a ball into a hole is just to pick it up, walk down the fairway and drop it in the hole. But that, of course, is not how you're supposed to play golf. There's limitations on what you can do. You have to use a club to hit the ball to get it in the hole. And there are all sorts of other rules about when you're not allowed to ground your club, when you're in a hazard and you have to drop it out of certain areas. So there's all these additional constitutive rules that place constraints on how we can get the ball into the hole. Those are the constitutive rules. And the illusory attitude then is just like a positive orientation towards the game, is that you accept the constitutive rules as the constraints on how you achieve the goal. The short way of expressing Suits' view of what a game is, is that it is the voluntary triumph over arbitrary obstacles. That's the essence of what a game is. And so what I'm arguing for in the book is that we can actually use this as a model for a utopian form of existence, where we should, what we should try to do is to play games, create more games, explore a landscape of different possible games. And this holds within it the potential for a utopia. But the key thing then about that understanding is that it doesn't have to be computer simulated. We can be playing games in the real physical world, and that would count as a form of virtual existence because... Again, to go back to the point I made about Harari, for me, what's wrong with Harari is that he doesn't acknowledge that some people don't see the rules and constraints on their behavior as purely arbitrary, whereas when you're playing a game, you are aware of the fact that they are arbitrary. The way in which you discuss virtual utopia, in one instance, is like a game, as you just described, but you also describe it as an opportunity for world building. I wonder if you could explain that second form of uh, understanding a virtual utopia and then bring those together to help us understand what a virtual utopia might actually look like in practice. Right. So you're right. I, there are two arguments that I have for a virtual utopia. One is based on this game-like model. And the other one is a slightly more political understanding of what a virtual utopia is. So I look at the work of the philosopher Robert Nozick, who wrote a famous book back in the 70s called Anarchy, State and Utopia. And that book is famous for the anarchy and state parts. But most people ignore the last part of the book, which is the utopian part, which to me is actually the most interesting part of the book because it's the most novel part of it. He has this very interesting analysis of what a utopia is. What he says is that a utopian world is a world that is stable. And a world that is stable is a world in which every member of that world likes it more than any other possible 
world. And then he argues, well, you can't possibly realize a utopia in the real world because everyone has different understandings of what an ideal form of existence would look like. They have different preferences, different ways in which they will order what is valuable and important to them. Some people might prioritize playing, to use the game analogy, like one kind of game over another kind of game. So we can't have a utopia in which everyone is forced to play chess or you know, to use a literary illustration, Herman Hesse has this novel, The Glass Bead Game, where there's this one single game that everyone is oriented towards playing in society. This is the source of meaning and value in that society. That that doesn't look utopian because some people have different preferences. So Nozick says, well, you can't realize a stable world, a utopian world. So what can you do? And he says, well, well what you can do is you can try to create a meta-utopia. And what that means is you create a world-building mechanism, a way in which people can create the kind of world that they prefer, that matches their preferences. And then somehow they're kept isolated from people with competing preferences. Now, he argues that a libertarian minimal state is the meta-utopia. Because a minimal state allows people to create these different associations that have whatever value structure they prefer, and they can live within those associations, and they can migrate between different associations if they like. And all the state does is it just tries to keep the peace between the different associations. And that's what a meta-utopia is. It's, just, it's a world-building mechanism for people, not something to create the associations that they prefer. So what I argue in the book is that I think that's an interesting proposal, a model of what utopian existence would look like, but it faces some practical limitations, particularly if we're going to try and realize it in the real world, in the, in the physical world, because there are geographical limitations of space. You know, how are we going to create all these different worlds, these different associations? How are you actually going to police the boundaries between the different associations? And what if one association there, what they prefer to do is to convert everybody else to their cause, their missionaries or imperialists. That's the language that Nozick uses in his analysis. So it seems like it's going to be very practically difficult to do, to do this. So what I do suggest, and this is where I do rely heavily on the notion of a kind of computer simulated model of, utopia, of virtual utopianism, is that what we could do is that we could create different worlds in a computer simulated environment and we don't face the same kinds of physical constraints and concern practical difficulties that we would face in Nozick's vision of a meta utopia. So I don't see those two different utopias, the utopia of games and the utopia of the virtual meta utopia as two different things. I think they're kind of complementary visions of what a virtual utopia is. You can play the games, you can also create these different virtual computer simulated associations in which you can consort with like-minded people. I should also add, though, that when I argue for this utopian vision, or one in which we can build different worlds and we can play different games, I don't mean by that that those are the only things that we do. Right? It's not that we only ever play games. There's still lots of other things that are open to you in life. You can have friendships, you can have families, you can have different kinds of social organizations, you can perform good moral deeds towards your neighbors. Like These things are all still accessible to us in this model. It's just that instead of work being the tr main focus or traditional political structures being the main focus of our attention, we focus on games instead. If these are possible utopias, then why don't we start them right now here on terra firma, here on terrestrial earth? There are so many problems that we could solve through gamifying certain things, such as climate change, that would enable us to continue to live on this planet rather than go off and live our cyborg future out in space. And I wonder, could what you were proffering in the book be applied to the real world as we live in it now with the challenges that we're facing on the horizon, the, the biggest one being climate? To some extent, I think that what I'm proposing in the book is already happening. I use some examples that suggest that the amount of time that people spend on leisure playing computer games as, as one illustration of this has inc increased particularly young people over time because they, they find it more difficult to find employment. Right? So it's already the case that there's this kind of gamification of life taking place. And whether it could be used to solve existential risks like, like climate change, you know, there are people who are experimenting with ways of harnessing collective intelligence and artificial intelligence to solve some of these problems. You know, I think Thomas Malone from MIT, he wrote this interesting popular book last year called Superminds, where he talks about a lot about some of the ways in which his lab are trying to create these games that enable people to come up with policy proposals to solve real world problems, which are, have a, a gamified structure to them. And I, I, so I think those proposals are interesting. One of the assumptions that I do have in the book is that I think we're going to increasingly rely on, again, artificial intelligence and machines and automating technologies to address 
some of these problems over time. Uh, I, I spoke to a guy called Miles Brundage about this actually on my own podcast. And, you know, he has this interesting paper. He wrote the conditional case for optimism about AI and it's very conditional, but the, one of the main points he makes is that AI can actually help to solve global coordination problems that we have, including problems around like arms control and climate change. We can use gamified structures to address some of these problems, but I think it's going to be partly a collaboration between humans and machines and also increasingly something that we outsource to machines. In that case, cyborg utopia or virtual utopia, if you had to pick, which one would you choose, John? I come down in favor of the virtual utopia because I think it's more practically achievable in the short run. And I think it also does contain something that is something genuinely post-work and also allows for a serious kind of human flourishing. Like, that's not something that we've addressed in this conversation. So just, let me just can briefly say that when I initially present this notion of a utopia of games to people, they recoil from it because they think it's something trivial about that existence. But I, I, I try to point out that actually there's lots of good things that you can achieve within a game. You know, you can perform moral acts within a game-like structure. You can achieve mastery over certain skill set. And there are intrinsic goods associated with the activities that you perform in a game. It also provides this infinite landscape of possibility for us to explore. So it, it fits with this horizontal model of utopianism that I was outlining earlier on. Um, I'm not, however, you know, completely opposed to the cyborg utopia. As it has come out in this conversation, there are certain ways of becoming cyborg-like that I think feed into this kind of virtual model of utopia. It's, a, it's kind of about new kinds of entertainment, as we were saying, and new forms of of existence and not about d doubling down on the, on the worst features of, of human existence. On balance, though, I think that the cyborg utopia is less likely in the medium term. And so that's why I favor the virtual utopia. I mean, these are the two things that link these forms of utopia. Is it really the fact that a post-work society is going to give us so much more opportunity ex to explore a spectrum of difference in the ways in which we live in the future? Yeah, I, so I think I think that's right. I, mean, I like the way that you framed it, which I, I wish I had now used in the book, which is that we've, we have two possibilities, which is experimenting with our bodies and minds and experimenting with the environments in which we live. One corresponds to the cyborg utopia and one corresponds to the virtual utopia. And you know, even though I am skeptical about the medium term prospects of the cyborg utopia, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't pursue it. It's partly an issue of like prioritization of resources over time. And where we want to put things, so th it can be put um, on the back burner to some extent. How confident do you feel that either of these utopias will ever be achieved? Yeah, look, that's a great question. I, so I, I don't necessarily feel confident that either of them will be achieved. Right? One thing I say in the book, and I've said a lot in interviews that I've given, is that you know, I'm not a technological determinist or fatalist. I don't think these things are just naturally going to happen. These are things that will require political effort and you know, collective effort. So it's not something that's going to happen as a matter of course. We'll have to agitate for it, reform our societies in favor of it. I had a very specific aim in this book, which was to evaluate the different possible post-work utopias. Because I felt that this was something that was not being done in the literature on automation in the human future. So there's kind of an, an assumption that these things will be great and there are implied principles of ethical principles and value principles that guide that, that claim, but they're not made explicit and they're not subjected to a kind of rigorous analysis. And that was what I was aiming to do in the, in the book. The hope is that by articulating a vision of what would be a good post-work utopia, this will provide the motivation to think about how we can really practically implement it. So really, this is a book that is there to inspire a multitude of possibilities for a post-work future that encourage people not to be so pessimistic of the idea of human obsolescence in the workplace. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's a book that's trying to in motivate and inspire people towards a positive vision of the future. I'm John Danaher, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you to John for sharing his insights into the developments that might massively transform the world of work. You can find out more by purchasing his book, Automation in Utopia, Human Flourishing in a World Without Work, available now. If you like what you've heard, then you can subscribe for our latest episode. Or follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Futures Podcast. 
More episodes, transcripts, and show notes can be found at futurespodcast.net. Thank you for listening to the Futures Podcast.